Well, friends, good morning. This June 21st to worship at Clarely Park Presbyterian Church. My name is Kevin Livingston and I'm the pastor. Uh, obviously, I'm not in the building and I'm not wearing my, uh, my clergy collar. Uh, that's partly because uh, yesterday I was in the church doing some, uh, some work and it was very hot. So I ask you to excuse me today, but we can be surrounded by the beauty of God's creation, as you can see behind me in the backyard of our home. We're here to worship the Lord, and it's good to be together, especially on this Father's Day when we have an opportunity to say thank you to God for the fathers in our lives and for all earthly fathers and those who act as fathers to uh, many ar around them. We thank God for our parents. So let's hear these words from Scripture as the Lord calls us to worship Him today. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with singing. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Let's offer up our prayers to God. Let's pray. Lord God, we come into your presence now as a church family, mindful of your love and your care in our lives. Lord, the wonders of your creation, which we, which we see around us this very first day of summer, the splendor of the heavens, the beauty of the earth, the order and the richness of nature around us, of your creation. All of these things speak to us of your glory. The coming of your Son, the pouring out in the presence of your Holy Spirit, the fellowship we have in your church, all of these show us the marvels of your love and your care in our lives. O oh God, this morning we worship and adore you today. O oh God of grace and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of mercy, God of love, in humbleness of heart we would confess and acknowledge our sins to you. We forget to love and serve you and wander from your ways. We're careless of your world and put its life in danger. We talk about our concern for others, but all too often, Lord, we fail to match our words with action. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, be with us in every experience of our lives. When we neglect you, remind us of your presence. When we are frightened, give us courage. When we are tempted, give us the power to resist. When we're feeling anxious or worried, give us peace. When we are weary in serving, give us renewed energy and zeal. For the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, friends, together, let's sing the beautiful hymn, This is My Father's World.
Before we come to the reading of God's Word and Scripture and the sermon, uh, we have the privilege of having not one but two special events for this Father's Day. First of all, a gospel quartet uh, singing, singing heartily to the Lord. And then secondly, a special word from Dory Heffron, Glenn and Dee's daughter. Just a cabin in the corner of glory land. 
Well, I'm in my backyard, but through the wonders of technology, we have the opportunity to hear from Dory Heffron on this special day. Hello, Dory. Hello. Hello, and, everybody. And where, and where are you speaking from? I am speaking from Henry's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> the bed is made. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. And this is a, this is a special uh, day, I think, but uh, you, of course, Dory, are the daughter of, of Glenn and Dee Heffron, and mm -hmm. And you're the your mom of Henry, who I am. you know, at our church family, and so uh, we're just delighted to say hello to you. And you have something special to share with us today. I do. I have a special poem. It is called "What Is a Dad" by Anne Marie Campbell. A, a dad is patient, helpful, and strong. He is there by your side when things go wrong. He's somebody who guides you and helps you do the right thing. And he helps you solve life's small little things. A dad is somebody who is loving and kind and usually knows what's going on in your mind. He is somebody who listens and makes time to talk. When things are bad, he doesn't turn around and walk. He is a strong shoulder when times are tough and still loves you dearly when he's had enough. <laughs> he helps you and guides you and all that he can wants nothing more than to make you a man or a woman in my case okay. a dad's there when you're happy and even more when you're sad giving unconditional love whether you're good or you're bad a dad is somebody that you can also call a friend who is there no matter what and will be there till the very end they say that blood is thicker than water but I know this isn't true because my son couldn't ask for a better dad than the one he found in you. I think of all the years gone by and wonder how different things would have been if his real father put forth the love that you have shown him. Happy Father's Day, Glenn, AKA Papa. Thank you for showing my son what a real father is and for loving him as much as you do. You will always have a special place in my heart and his. Oh, Dory, thank you so much. That is beautiful. Thank you. And that was for all the fathers of the congregation. Oh, that's kind. Well, listen, the Lord bless you and Henry and uh, hang in there. We know that uh, with, with your work with the children, uh, now that it's just opened up again, I know that's added to your busy life. Yes. But bless you and thank you for making this a very special Father's Day for a whole lot of people this week. And thank you. All right. God bless. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property with prodigal living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare. But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him 
and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his, his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we're looking at a familiar story Jesus told, often known as the story of the prodigal son. But we're actually going to be looking at this story for three weeks in a row because there's three characters. There's the younger son, an older son, and a father. And each week we're going to look at the story through the perspective of one of those characters. So don't think I'm just repeating myself next week. We're doing this on purpose. Today we're looking at the story through the eyes of the younger son. This son is privileged in so many ways, as is his older brother. He's the son of an influential, wealthy man in the village. The son was born into some wonderful privileges, never worrying about where he, he would lay his head at night, never wanting for food. He has lots of status in the community. When he shows up to events and gatherings in his village as the son of this wealthy landowner, he's one of the privileged, favored people. He enjoys more freedom than the other young men in the community as the son of this wealthy landowner. In other words, he's got a lot going for him. But he's unhappy. He's unsettled. He's, he's frustrated because he doesn't want to keep living in the shadow of his father, always known as the charge of his father, living under the yoke of his father, and the responsibilities that belong to him in the family business. He wants to be free, to be autonomous. He wants to be his own man, and he's more than a little bit impatient to get there. Now, there was a way that he could become his own man, gain more freedom, but it would take a long time. He could be a faithful son, he could take responsibilities for the things that are his to do in running the estate and do a good job at that. And over time, his father could give him more and more responsibility so that over a period of years, his father would naturally transfer bigger portions of the household tasks and duties and wealth to both of his sons, including this one, the younger brother. He could do that, but this younger son is impatient. He wants his freedom and he wants it right now. So he goes to his father with an incredibly brash request. He says, Father, give me my share of the estate. There's a well-known Bible scholar named Ken Bailey who was also a Presbyterian missionary in the Middle East for many, many years. Ken Bailey has done a lot of work concerning the teaching of the Bible in the setting of the Middle East, in particular the parables in Jesus and Luke's Gospel, like this one that we're studying today. Bailey knows that culture very well and brings out things in the text that are hard for us living here in Canada to see and understand because we don't know the culture of the Middle East where Jesus lived. Bailey says that every time he would tell this story, the story of the prodigal son to, to common people, to peasant people in the villages of the Middle East, they, were, they would be shocked by the audacity of this young man. The reason they're shocked is that to give his younger son his share of the estate, 
which would probably have been one-third of the total estate, the father would have had to sell off a big chunk of his cattle and property almost immediately in order to get the inheritance money together. Remember, friends, this is before banks, before checks. The father would have to scramble to quickly sell off a big chunk of his cattle and property to generate the inheritance money that his son was demanding. But this would probably have also had a huge economic impact on the whole village because it drove down the prices of those assets for the other villagers as well since the father was being to was being forced to flood the market so that he could come up with quick cash to give to his son to peasant people in the middle east this kind of behavior would be seen as shocking scandalous and embarrassing but Bailey says there's another reason that people would be shocked by this younger son's request. What's really shocking, what's really scandalous, is the fact that the younger son asks for his inheritance right now while his father is still alive. In other words, the younger son is saying, in effect, Father, I wish you were dead. Imagine that. The shame, the embarrassment, the indignity, the mortification, the disgrace of this kind of behavior, especially in a patriarchal culture where families were tight and close-knit and incredibly respectful of the father of the household. The inheritance both sons would receive one day when their father passed away, that inheritance was secure. But here's the younger son wishing or acting as if his father was already dead. Clearly, for the son, it's a transactional relationship. And the son is saying, all I want is your wealth. That, that's all I want from you. And this would be heartbreaking for any parent to hear a child to say that to them. A parent back in the Bible days or any parent today. So right off the bat, we're introduced to this younger son. So friends, let me ask you a question. How do you see this young man? I assume you probably, you probably don't like him very much. He's acting ungrateful, a little bit compulsive, somewhat spoiled and entitled, wanting his own way and wanting it right now. But before we judge him too harshly, I want us to slow down for a moment and try to see ourselves in his shoes, to see ourselves in this story. Because this story, as unpleasant as it is, is the story of all of us, each and every one of us. We are sons and daughters of the King. God created us different from all the other creatures, with God's imprint, with God's image stamped deeply into our nature. We've been made to reflect God's goodness and wisdom and love. That's what it means to be made in God's image, to be God's image bearers. Each one of us have been given bodies and minds and souls which we didn't earn or get because of something we've done. These gifts come to us as gifts from the God who created us. And as we were reminded a few weeks ago, God is the one who's put the breath of his spirit into our lungs, who gives us the very gift of life. And he put us into a world that was designed for us to live in, this beautiful world of sight and sound and colors and smells of food and water and all the other things that sustain us in life. We have all been born into this privileged position. But each one of us, like the younger son, struggles with this idea of being under someone who's greater than us. We rebel being under the authority and the supervision of the one that we call God, our Creator. God our Father. 
the one who's supposed to be the Lord and the master of our lives. But each one of us, the Bible says, has staged a rebellion against God. We've wanted to manage our own lives. We've wanted autonomy and freedom like the younger son, to do things our own way. We've closed our hearts to God and turned our backs on the rules of the house, on God's laws that were given for our protection, but we see them as an infringement upon our freedom. We want to manage our own lives in our own way. I know the word sin is not a popular word. It's a word we don't like to hear in our culture today and even in the church. But I think it's because when most of us hear the word sin, maybe we think of a list of all the bad things we're not supposed to do. And while that's partially accurate, sins do include the things we're not supposed to do. I think it's more accurate to think of those things not as sins in themselves, but symptoms of sin. Sin is actually much more fundamental than some don't-do list that we generate in our minds. Sin is more basic than that. Because you see, at its core, sin is turning away from God and saying, I don't want you to be in charge of my life. I want to be in charge of my own life. And so like the younger son, we turn away from the one who's supposed to be in charge of us. We turn away from the God that made us because we want to be free and autonomous. And while we might not say that we want to see God dead when we're in that mode of wanting to be in charge of our own lives, the thought of God being out there telling us how we're supposed to live, even if it's for our own good, is offensive to us. It's distasteful to us. And so some of us are fearful of God or we want to keep God at a distance, at arm's length not lurking over our shoulder, telling us what to do. We want him as good as dead, even if we don't use that kind of language. According to the Bible, that's the state we find ourselves in, as a human race. And I think all of us can find ourselves to some extent in the story of the younger son. And in response to this audacious request for his share of the estate, notice the father. He doesn't protest. The father doesn't refuse his son's request. The father simply frees up the resources and sells off the necessary property and cattle and gives his son what he has so rudely asked for. I'm sure it broke the father's heart, but he gave him what the son wanted. So now the son goes off to a far country to go far away from his father and the village as possible. And then our text tells us that he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now if you're familiar with the story, I wonder what kind of picture comes into your mind when we hear about the son at this point. He squandered his wealth in wild living. I, I heard somebody say when they read this verse that they thought of their university days with tequila shots and lampshades on their heads. Wild living. Waking up in the gutter not knowing who you are and how you got there. Uh, that's how some of us read the passage, but it might not be quite what Luke has in mind that he's telling us here. Different translations put it like this. He wasted his money in foolish living. He wasted his wealth through extravagant living. Undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. The idea, I think, is more that he was irresponsible. He lived in an irresponsible way. In that culture at the time, what a person would do who had the financial means was probably not tequila shots and lampshades on their head. What they would want to do to establish themselves in a new community was to be the, the big man on campus, to show how important they were 
by what they did with their money. They would want to have a reputation as an important person. And the way they'd communicate that was by being a generous person, throwing big banquets and parties and inviting all sorts of people to them. They would give lavish gifts in order to make the right impression on other people. It's not that they would give parties to be wild and reckless, but they would be extravagantly generous so that people would respect them and look up to them. When they walk by, other people would see them as a very important person. Like some people today who, who shape their Facebook profile to look always beautiful and smart and successful. So I think it's more faithful to see this younger son not like a wild partier, but as someone who's trying to establish his own reputation and get noticed and get respected on his own. So what happens next? The problem isn't so much the kind of things he spent his money on, but that it was unsustainable. You, you can't keep on spending money when it starts to run out. He wants to be autonomous, but the reality is he's not autonomous. He doesn't have an income source. He's just spending his father's inheritance money. That worked for a while, but eventually it ran out. He spent everything he had, and now there was no more money coming in, and then an external problem arose. A great famine swept over the land, and now he's in trouble. So eventually he realizes that his plan is at a dead end. His dream of quick freedom is unsustainable. He's going nowhere. And that's true in human life today as well. When somebody decides they don't want God to be in charge of their lives, they start making choices about how they want to manage their lives. Someone can live that way for a while especially when they're young. It works for a while, but eventually it falls flat. Eventually, it comes to a dead end. In our quest for autonomy, we might pursue some kind of success, however we understand success, and either that success, it eludes us, and we're disappointed with our lives, or we get the success we're after, but we find that it's kind of empty. It's not as satisfying as we thought it would be. As Peggy Lee put it in her song years ago, is that all there is? Is that all there is? We gather around us friends that we like, friends that make us laugh, friends that we trust, but eventually we need people to lean on, to rely on, people to help us. And in many cases, Lots of those friends, even our friends, can let us down. We realize that people aren't always as solid as we thought they were. Sometimes we let ourselves down, and we're disappointed with ourselves too. And so a lot of people, when they're young, they adopt this strategy of, of ignoring or walking away from God, and it may work for a while, but they come to realize that over time, Life is a lot harder than they thought it was going to be. And they realize they don't have the resources to make it on their own the way they thought they could. And their hopes and dreams get dashed. And that's when they have to start making choices that aren't so easy. So what happened to this particular prodigal son in our story? He has to hire himself out to another man, a stranger, in this new community where he's living. And ironically, he wanted to be away from the burden of being under his father's yoke and authority. But now, in need, in desperation, he has to put himself under the authority of someone who's a lot less kind and forgiving as his father was to him. The man hires this younger son, but he didn't, want, he didn't think much of him or care much about his feelings, did he? How do we know that? 
Well, look at the job he gives them to do. He's assigned the task, the young man is, of feeding the pigs. That means that his new boss was probably a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, and he was probably, the young son was, in living in a Jewish village, a Gentile, a Gentile village, I should say. For Jewish people, pigs were an unclean animal and pork was forbidden to eat. And so to give that kind of a job to a Jewish man for whom pork is forbidden and unclean must have been humiliating and, degra and degrading. This job was the lowest of the low, like being given the job of cleaning toilets 24-7. But the young man was desperate and he took the job because he's hungry. He has to eat. And he sees what a deplorable state he's in, a far worse condition than he'd ever been in before, having to eat the food that the pigs were eating. And friends, that's often the case with us too. When we rebel against God, when we want to go our own way, we find ourselves in situations and in places we never thought we'd be in. And it's not very pleasant. We have this dream that we can be autonomous, that, that we can be free and easy on our own. But the reality is, as Bob Dylan put it in one of his songs, everybody's got to serve somebody. <laughs> You've got to serve somebody. And we have to choose whether it's going to be God or someone or something else. This young man discovered that and many of us have discovered that as well. That's the way life is. So he's in a miserable situation but then the story starts to look up. I love this part of the story. The text says he came to his senses and in the midst of the squalor and hopelessness the younger son comes to his senses and he remembers home. He remembers his father. He remembers it was pretty good back there. I love this part of the story because it's a memory of what was and what should have been. You know, there's a genre, there's a form of stories that were popular back in the 19th and the early 20th century in America that were called Horatio Alger stories. Have you ever heard of them? So called because that was the name of the author, Horatio Alger. Maybe you're familiar with the concept, if not the name. Horatio Alger stories are rags to riches stories. Oftentimes an immigrant in a new land, impoverished boys and girls who start out with nothing at all, but through hard work and determination and effort and ingenuity, they succeed and find economic and social security. My own dear father loved those kind of stories, and his own life was a kind of a Horatio Alger story. But the prodigal son is a kind of mirror opposite of the Horatio Alger story. It's not a rags to riches story, it's a riches to rags story. But thank goodness it's also a return home kind of story too. And what I love about this part of the story is that it's also true for us in our relationship with God our Heavenly Father. Whenever we think about making our way back to God, if, if we've been away from God, it's not adding on something new. It's always returning home. Maybe to the home we never knew we had, but it's a return home. It's always coming back to a Father who deeply, desperately loves us. This is true not only for people who've been raised in the church or, or done okay in their lives or, or if they've messed up just a little. No, this is true for everybody. No matter how messed up you think your life is or if you weren't raised in the church or if this is all kind of unfamiliar for you, when you consider, be, when you consider becoming a Christian or, or coming back to God, it's always a return home. 
to the home that you're supposed to be in, to the home you were created to be in, even if you've strayed away from it for a while. It's, a, it's encouraging to know that we're coming home when we turn back to God. But before the son comes home, the son has got to figure out what he needs to do. After what he's done, he can't just saunter home and walk back in and pick up where he's left off. So he comes up with a plan about how he'll swallow his pride and attempt to go back to his father's home. But it's going to be a challenge for a number of reasons. First of all, he has to get through the village. Because what this younger son did when he left his home was not only heartbreaking for his father, but shameful for the whole village. In those days, in a Jewish village, there was a, a practice or a ceremony that they would do when someone left the community and went to live with Gentiles, which is what this young man had apparently done. It wasn't a friendly ceremony, but a hostile ceremony called Kazara. Village leaders would, would meet him at the gate of the village with a clay pot, and they would break it in front of everyone in the village and pronounce that you are cut off from this community and you are not welcome back. And that's what the young man faced when he came back, a hostile village of people who'd been shamed by his actions with Gentiles. And of course, another challenge, the basic one he faced as he goes back, is the change in status they'll have to accept as the price tag of being able to come home at all. He decides he will return and beg his father to take him back as a hired servant. He's not going to ask to be brought back as his father, to his father's household as a son. He, he thinks that option is off the table. But maybe if he returns as a servant and begs his father's forgiveness, the father might help him get past that gauntlet of angry villagers and then give him some menial job where he can begin to pay back his father for at least some of his squandered inheritance. That way he could gain some of his dignity back and pay his way back. Now, of course, that'd be a pretty steep climb because if, if he's burned through one-third of his father's entire estate, he'll never be able to pay it all off, pay it all back. But if he can come home and work as a hired hand, at least he'll have some food to eat and a roof over his head. So on his journey home, he prepared his speech. He'd acknowledge the stupid decision he'd made and beg for mercy and ask for work as a lowly servant. It's a pretty far-fetched idea, but he's going to try to pay his way back into his father's good graces and try to earn even a fraction of his position back again to be with the father. Now, dear friends, this part of the story really rings true as the way many of us think we're supposed to come back to God. Lots of people have a story something like this. They're raised in the church, but they wandered away for a while. They've been away in a far country, but now they're trying to get their life back together. They want to return home. They want to get into a relationship with God, but they feel like they have to pay their way back. So they come to church and they think to themselves, what do I need to do to earn my way back into God's favor? How often do I, do I need to come to church or, or, or tune in on this YouTube service? Do I have to start giving financially? Do I have to help out at the bazaars and the bake sales? Do I have to attend the prayer meetings? Now, listen, all of those things are, are good things to do. But what breaks my heart is that people feel they have to earn their way back. They have to do certain things in order for God to love them, in order for God to accept them into his family. They're doing these things in order to earn God's approval because they don't yet know 
that they don't have to earn God's favor. God our Father wants to give it back to us absolutely free. And that's why the end of this story is so important for us to hear. The son wants to earn his way back, and he's rehearsing his speech all the way home in his head that he's going to give to his father. But before he can give his speech, from a far distance, it says, from a long ways away, the father sees his son coming. The son doesn't even have to walk all the way home. He just has to take that first step towards his father. And then a smile breaks out on his father's face as he sees his beloved son on his way back. And the text says his father's heart was filled with compassion. He loves his son. The son hasn't even... He, the father hasn't even heard the I'm sorry speech yet, and he doesn't need to. Instead, the father runs to his son and throws his arms around him and kisses him and says, Welcome home. Now, we'll talk more about this amazing father in a few weeks. But for now, I want you to see the father running sprinting to his son, love in his eyes, his arms open wide, and then feel his embrace around his little boy who's finally come home. This one who was lost now has been found. I want you to keep that image, that, that picture of the running father in your mind for a moment. Think about all of us. All of us who've been running away from God, knowing that some of the choices we've made have been dead ends, that we need to make our way back to God. We want to go home. And then taking just one step, thinking we're going to have to earn and work our way back into God's good graces. But then seeing the delight in our Heavenly Father's eyes as He sprints toward us, and welcomes us back. The Father welcomes us home with Him, home where we belong. Friends, I want to pause today to say that there may be some of you who feel like that prodigal son this morning. Maybe you felt far away from God, but now you want to reconnect with God. And so you're watching this YouTube service and you want to get reconnected with the church again. Or maybe you're thinking like the prodigal son did, that you need to, to pay your way back because you've been away and you need to earn a place at the table. If there is anyone out there who wants to come back to God, or maybe you've never known God personally, but you're listening today, hoping you can find your way back, I want to give you an opportunity to take that first step, just like the prodigal son did in our story, and experience the Father coming for you, coming towards you with love and bringing you home. If you're wanting to take that step, the only thing you need to do, the only thing, is to be willing to acknowledge that you've turned away from God and that you want God's forgiveness. That's all you need to do. I know that, that a lot of us at Clarely Park Church, we've already done that. But it's so important to me that everyone who hears me this morning talking gets an opportunity to say yes to this gift that the Father wants to give to every one of us. So in a moment, I want us to bow our heads. And if you are a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, however you want to define that, <laughs> and you want to take a step towards your Heavenly Father, you can echo this prayer that I'm going to pray in your heart this morning. Please join me in prayer. Father God, 
I acknowledge that I was born to be your son or your daughter. And yet, Lord, I've turned away from that privileged position and I've wanted to be my own master. I've wanted to be in charge of my own life. And Lord, I confess that that hasn't always worked out very well for me. And I need to be back in your household. I need to be back in your good graces. So Lord, I confess my sin. I acknowledge my sin to you. And I accept the free gift of forgiveness that you want to give me through Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, I can hardly believe it, but I trust that what's in the scriptures is true. That you love me, that your heart is filled with compassion for me, and you are excited to welcome me home just as I am. So, Lord, I gladly accept this free gift, and I thank you for your love for me and for your forgiveness and for welcome me, welcoming me home. Thank you, God, that when, that when we turn to you in faith, you give us true freedom. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus my Savior. Amen. Amen, friends. The Lord bless you today. Before we come to our time of prayer, we have another special treat for you. Uh, three of our, our children will be singing the lovely song, You Lift Me Up. And it's a song not just about human beings who've been inspirational and loving in our lives, but ultimately it's a song of praise to God, the God who lifts us up and redeems and saves us. Friends, now let's bring our prayers to the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, rejoicing in your blessings, trusting in your loving care for all people, we bring you our prayers for the world. We pray, O oh God, for the created world, for those who rebuild where things have been destroyed, for those who fight hunger and poverty and disease, especially the COVID virus at this time. 
for those who have the power to bring change for the better and to renew hope for the life of our world Lord your kingdom come your will be done we pray O God for our land of Canada for those who frame our laws and shape our common life for those who keep the peace and administer justice for those who teach for those who heal and all who serve the community in the life of our land O Lord your kingdom come your will be done we pray God for people in need those for whom life has become a bitter struggle those whose lives are clouded by death or loss by pain or disability by discouragement or fear by shame or rejection in the lives of those in need today O Lord may your kingdom come your will be done we pray O God for those in the circle of friendship and love around us for children and parents for sisters and brothers for friends and for neighbors and for those especially in our thoughts today for fathers Heavenly Father you entrusted your son Jesus the child of Mary to the care of Joseph an earthly father bless all fathers Lord as they care for their families give them strength and wisdom tenderness and patience support them in the work they have to do protecting those who look to them as we look to you for love and salvation through Jesus Christ our rock and Redeemer we thank you God for the memories of beloved fathers who are in your presence we pray O oh God I pray all of us pray who are fathers that you would give us grace and help us to do the best we can to be your ambassadors and to show your love as we seek to live our lives in the lives of all fathers Lord and of all those we love may your kingdom come and your will be done we pray O God for your church in its stand with the poor in its love for the outcast and the needy in its service to the sick and neglected in its proclamation of the good news of the gospel of Christ in this land in this place among your people O Lord at Clarely Park Presbyterian Church in the life of your church Lord may your kingdom come and your will be done Almighty and everlasting God we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this new day in this new season of summer keep us O God from falling into sin or running into danger order us in all our doings and guide us to always do what is right and just in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray and now friends I would ask if you would join me as together we would pray the prayer Jesus taught his followers to pray saying together our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever Amen well friends now receive the blessing go in the peace of Christ and may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always 
Amen.